This episode is brought to you by Groove Washer, the best record cleaners and protective sleeves for your vinyl collection. Ask for the Groove Washer from your local shop or go to GrooveWasher.com. Discount code VinylGuide10. And now, on with the show. Welcome to the Vinyl Guide, the podcast for record collectors and music nerds. Here's your host, the biggest record nerd of them all, Nate Goyer. Ah, well, hey everyone, it's Nate. Welcome to episode 435, and I'm going to crack right into it. I've been holding on to some secrets for a while, and now I can finally share them. Fantastic news, everyone. A new Melvin's album has been announced. Tarantula Heart, which is now pre-orderable at Ipecac Records, ipecac.com. And uh, <laughs> a new Melvin's album is absolutely huge news in my house and around the world. And uh, even better... I've heard it, and it's absolutely killer. Tarantula Heart, very heavy, very top of form. Can't wait to hear it on vinyl. As you might imagine, it features the usual suspects, Buzz, Dale, and Steven. Uh, but they also have a few special guests, including Roy Mayorga of Ministry and Soulfly, as well as Gary Chester of Ed Hall and We Are the Asteroid. And those guys add additional drums, guitars, and synthesizers. Um, what else can I tell you? There's one massive track, Pain Equals Funny, which is nearly 20 minutes, and I suspect is going to be an amazing live experience when they play that. Now, the album was made in a very unique fashion. They recorded various sessions with the band improvising riffs and rhythms, then chopped those up and added a few other layers and rearranged the album. And again, it's really, really killer. You could secure a copy of Tarantula Heart at Ipecac Records, ipecac.com. There's some limited vinyl pressing, so snap those up while you still can. And it was my absolute honor to welcome Dale Crover back to the show. And today, Dale will not only walk us through how Melvin's made Tarantula Heart and, of course, add a few additional clues and insight, as well as discussing other rare records of his career, including a Houdini outtake, the Kiss solo-themed records, working with Helms Ali, Taylor Hawkins, Void Mains, and more. But Dale also talks about his recent surgery, the recovery, and what's next for him, Melvin's touring, solo stuff, and more. Fans of the band and their numerous records will definitely enjoy this conversation. So let's get right to it. Without further delay, let's speak to Dale Crover about Melvin's Tarantula Heart and more. Hey, how's it going? Sorry about that. Hey, Mr. Crover. How you doing, man? Doing good. How about yourself? Ah, it's bloody hot down here in Australia. So, Where are you? Uh, uh, Sydney. Hot? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. I was like, hot? What are you talking about? Okay. <laughs> Summertime, isn't it? Other, yes. Yes. The Southern Hemisphere. It's, uh, but you guys are going to be here soon. So you'll get to, you get to see for yourself. Yeah. 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 For sure. Well, actually, I'm not going to, I'm not going to be there, unfortunately. Oh, you're not going to um, make the trip? No. I'm not going to make the trip. I, uh, um, uh, I'm recovered from my surgery. I had back surgery not that long ago, but um, um, I'm doing fine. But before, uh, uh, we had to get the visas pretty early. So um, it was kind of uncertain whether I was going to be ready or not. So Cody Willis is going to fill in for me on this trip. Okay. So, yeah, I'm bummed about not coming. You know, I'd like to be down there. Ah, uh, we'll miss you. I'd like you. to be in that. But, yeah. Uh... Cody, Cody is a is is a worthy replacement. So um, that uh, besides that, fourteen hour plane ride probably wouldn't have been that comfortable if you're still recovering a bit. Y yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, look, <laughs> uh, we've got other sorry. things. <laughs> sorry, yeah. Sorry to disappoint everybody. I want. I'd, I'd love to be. I, I, everyone understands. That's totally oh, understandable. So. And that was actually a question that I had. Like, okay, all right. Well, you know, they're coming straight out the <laughs> gate. That's a long flight. That's it's physically arduous to be in that position for a 14 hour flight. So, uh, yeah. Good. Well, I mean, honestly, I'd be okay to do it, but you know, mm -hmm. the damn government. Sorry. Ah, <laughs> okay. Yeah. They're pretty strict here. Uh, I was just talking to some Australian bands that are having similar difficulties getting over to the U S so it's just a, I'm a sure. pa pain in the ass for artists all over the place. They don't make it easy. It is. Mm. Yes. It is well, look, exactly. we are, uh, celebrating, uh, the announcement of, uh, Tarantula Heart. Right. Um, the new uh, Melvin's up. Now, I did notice something on the cover. It's the Melvin's. And I've always said Melvin's tried to be very kind of clear on that. In your mind, is it Melvin's or the Melvin's? Either way is fine. I know. Both. It's both. both. 
Yeah. <laughs> and neither. <laughs> right. At least you're not changing the spelling like OCs every few albums. So uh, that's helpful. So, okay. Tarantula Heart pre-orders available February 6th on Ipecac. There's some special vinyl versions that are getting ready to come out and a Working the Ditch video that is available. I'll link to that in this episode. So this album came together right. very strange, as I understand. It, well, most Melvin's Somewhere. albums have their own <laughs> their own story, but t- tell me the story about Tarantula Heart. Well, we started recording this. Um, it would be almost two years in, I believe, about April or May. Mm-hmm. And... Um, it started by, uh, like, after we did this tour with Ministry, we invited their drummer, Roy Mayorga, to come and um, just kind of jam with us in the studio. And we recorded it. And it was he and I just, like, kind of talking a little bit before recording of what we were going to do. Um, and, you know, we were thinking some things, like, like there's at least a few things that were, um, I would say, influenced by the public, public image record. Um, um, Flowers of Romance, which we've been big fans of for a long time and have been influenced by in the past. So, you know, really the whole thing started out with drums and um, uh, we were playing along. Well, the guitar player and the bass player, Stephen and Buzz, were playing along to us. And, um, you know, it, it was kind of um, they were improvised jams and then we turned them into something a bit more. And they sound pretty much nothing like what they sounded like when we first recorded them. <laughs> <laughs> so I was I was done a long time ago, and then it turned into something you know much different. Also, Roy came and he, he played um, not only drums, but he he um, he brought in like a really old synthesizer that he had and laid some stuff down with that. Yeah, um, yeah, it's a, it's very heavy. I've been fortunate enough to be able to hear it. Yeah, it's it's weird psychedelic. It's like psychedelic heavy metal, sort of mm-hmm. you know, sort of improvised in a way. Like we're also really into like the seventies uh, um, electric miles records mm-hmm. which oh, you know, big had some structure and, yeah yeah but but i mean those records had some structure but it was very loose and that's kind of what this was um though i don't know if you can tell by the end result really what was going on in the beginning you know i don't think anybody would really know no because if i hadn't had kind of heard a little bit of the story like uh if, if uh, i guess the way i read it was you guys recorded a bunch of pieces and then it was yeah. rearranged. So definitely. Okay. Definitely. All right. I, and and I couldn't tell that at all. It all flowed into uh, part to part. So I, yeah, it's if I hadn't known the that, magic, the magic of the recording studio and a creative mind, I guess you know. Um, you know the songs are pretty long too. They're longer than um, you know. I think there's things like what like maybe five songs on the record total, something yeah. like that. So they're pretty long. And we knew that that's, we knew we wanted to do some really long pieces going into the record, you know? Something like Pain Equals Funny, which is about 20 minutes. Uh, I yeah. guess I could see that as like almost a centerpiece of the live show. Maybe so. I mean, you know, we, we have not played any of this stuff other than recording, but I'm sure that, that, uh, that we'll work out something, you know? Mm-hmm. I mean, this record is not going to be out by the time the band goes to Australia, so they're not going to play any of it. Mm-hmm. You know, that'll be a, the next tour, most likely. Okay. You know, but there's a song there's a song on the last record called Mr. Dog. That's a really long song and I know that that kind of influenced what we wanted to do for this record, you know, like some really long pieces. You know, mm-hmm. so we really like the way that that came out. So the riffs were already present. So you and Roy were kind of dual drumming to Steven and Buzz and then those riffs hadn't changed. It's just the order and sequence of those. Is that I, I think the riffs changed from what they originally were, you know. I mean, okay. Like I said, Roy and I were the were the were the start of the whole thing, you know. And those guys kind of like I mean, it was it was um, it was just like a jam, really. It's like getting together, getting together, just improvising the whole thing, and then writing around what Roy and I did. And yeah, and you know, cut and paste here and there a little bit, um, maybe extended a few pieces. Um, I kind of don't even really know because I, you know I was I was somewhat done, and I know that Buzz did a lot of work on it, so. Buzz and Toshi, for sure. I know Toshi did a lot of work on it, especially in the mixing department, you know, piecing everything together. So these recordings were pre, pre-surgery. pre Oh, yeah. Were, were you yeah. in pain doing this? No, no. I mean, even, even before I had surgery, I wasn't really in a bunch of pain. You know, it was just like I thought I had a, a pinched nerve in my neck, 
you know, actually I thought at first that I had pulled the bicep, you know, I didn't really think it was a big deal. I mean, cause we were, we were touring, you know, when it happened, it was right before we did this tour with Mr. Bungle last May. And um, it was happened like the first day of rehearsals. I'm like, Oh fuck. I think I fucked my arm up, you know, but I kept playing, did that tour. I went to Europe and played and then came back and saw a doctor in between tours that we were doing. And that's when she um, did some tests on me and she's like, Hmm, you need an MRI. And I got that. And she just like shot me down, you know, and said I needed surgery, which was um, shocking, you know, mm. shocking because she's the doctor. When I had a, a lower back issue said, do everything that you can do to avoid surgery. So I wasn't expecting that. I wasn't expecting her to go, Oh, you need surgery. So, but you know, it was um, spinal stenosis where my, my, uh, uh, my spinal cord was being compressed by the discs in my neck. And so um, she referred me to a surgeon who pretty much didn't have any good news for me and told me if I didn't take care of it right away, that it was going to be a real problem. And so that's why I didn't do that last tour. Wow. Um, but so you had no was, idea of the seriousness. You had no idea. That no, was, not at all. Okay. It was totally shocking. You know, I had no idea that that, that that was the case. You know, like I said, I had a lower back issue where I ruptured a, a herniated disc in my lower back back that was much more painful you know so i didn't think that this was anything really at all mm -hmm. you know um like i said i'm pretty much i'd say i'm like beyond 95 percent recovered right now but just because of getting the having to get the visas for this thing so early you know it was it was uncertain mm. with the back issue is that something that would come back at all is that uh or is it gone for good well, with the, the thing I just had, I had fusion in my neck. So, you know, I don't think so. And with any other issues I have, I do a lot of, I do a lot of working out. I do Pilates and I do everything I can to like take care of my, take care of myself. You know, I mean, even before that happened, I was doing a lot of exercising and stuff. I'm just, I don't know. I mean, it's genetics, it's age. Um, but, you know, I take good care of myself and, and I'm sure I'm going to be able to do this for a long time. Well, yeah, I mean, you, you count on your body for a lot of things. And I think the last time you and I spoke in Sacramento, you had just done two, you were playing two sets a night, one with Harshmellow and one with Melvin. So oh, is, right, that, yeah. is that the sort of cadence you can continue or do you need to slow that down a bit? Um, I I don't see why, why I would have to slow down, you know. I'm old, but I ain't that old. <laughs> I say that because I'm, I'm, I'm feeling my age these days, uh, particularly pronounced. So <laughs> watching what you do it as hard as you hit those drums. Is it, do you know what may have caused that? I mean, just the hitting hard? Maybe, but my doctor said he didn't think so. He didn't think it had anything to do with drumming. You know, he just said age and genetics. Okay. So funny, I mean, Buzz has the same thing, actually, but he didn't have to have surgery for his. Oh, the same exact thing. Okay. Yeah, yeah, spinal stenosis. And it's 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 a common thing, you know. Even the surgery I had was really common, you know. It wasn't wasn't. I mean, <clears throat> it was major surgery, but um, you know, I was up and walking around the next day. Actually, I was up and walking around the day the day of. So, wow. you know, it wasn't like I was like bedridden for months and months mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So, I was up and moving the next day. In fact. I mean, I had to wear a a, a, um, a, a a collar on my neck, you know, like a dog for six weeks. But yeah, but I mean, after that, I started playing drums right away, and I'd already been playing guitar and shit like that anyway, you know. Okay. Sitting around doing nothing, so I had a um, I had an eight track and nothing to do, so I wrote a bunch of songs. <laughs> you got a new solo yeah. album getting ready. To... I do. Oh. I do. I'm recording it right now. I'm almost done with it. Oh, excellent! All right, can you yeah. share anything about that? Um, it's going to be 10 songs going to come out on joyful noise. There's some pretty cool guest stars that I can't name yet, but I will pretty soon. And, um, mm -hmm. uh, it'll probably be out in late summer, early fall. Oh, wow. Yeah, okay. It's almost done. Almost done. Well, let's talk about yeah. that when it's, uh, when it's ready to go. Now will, you, yeah. you were preparing for a tour that was the one with Boris and Mr. Flies. Yeah. Yes, um, yeah. when you had to sit out, did you see any of the shows? Have you seen Melvin's as a spectator? Only on on uh, clips online. Okay. I haven't been to a lot, so, so um, yeah, it was weird. It was weird for me, that's for sure. You know, but I'm glad that the whole thing didn't get canceled. Yeah, you know, I think it would have felt worse. You know, yeah. it would have put a lot of people out of work. So yeah. luckily, I was the only one out of work. Yeah. <laughs> well, mm -hmm. yeah. Look, everyone understood. I think when that news came in, I think everyone was just hoping that you were going to be all right, and uh, we're we're oh, yeah. very thankful for uh, Cody stepping in. 
Yeah, me too. I mean, you know, believe it or not, I didn't want to have surgery. (laughs) 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 It it wasn't something I planned. (laughs) All right. Well, it's good uh, you're you're roaring back. So, okay, understandably, you can't go to Australia. I think there's some Japan dates. Are you able to make those? No, they're on the same thing. Okay, big big swoop de swoop. Okay, but the shows in the U.S. you will. Now, I noticed that Buzz was going out with Trevor. Uh, yes, yeah, Trevor Dunn. Okay, so that that's the time for your solo stuff, I suspect. Yep, yep, that, and also uh, Red Cross is working on a new record, and we're supposed to tour as well. That's right. We're supposed to tour the U.S. in the summertime. So, yeah, you know, if there's any uh, Australian promoters that want to bring us down there, Red Cross is doing stuff. So, or me. Yeah, Let's start the visa process now. <laughs> right, I'm, I'm willing to come to Australia and hang out. <laughs> well, you're more than welcome. To, we just got a new couch. You're welcome to crash there. It's very comfortable on the okay. back too. I must say, great. Uh, <laughs> so I got a bunch of your projects that I wanted to talk about, and you, you brought up Joyful Noise, and you do a bunch of very interesting one-offs with Joyful Noise. And if you don't mind, yeah, let's kind of like, go into some of those weird sure. things. If that's all right. Um, sure. Wood and diamonds. It's um, oh yeah, the recording. Um, I think you, Steve McDonald. Um, who else is on there? Oh, Toshi. Toshi Kasai. Yeah. And Minnie Jorgensen. Yes. The Dale Crover band. Yes, yes, yes. yes. There's a special 100, uh, there's a special lathe cut, I think 127 yes. made. Right. And it's a, it's an art piece too. Who, who's, exactly. whose idea was that? How did that come together? Um, the guy that runs Joyful Noise, Carl, um, I started working with him because he wanted to do weird stuff like that. Like they, um, they have this guy that um, does all these weird lathe cut projects for them. And, you know, they just try to outdo themselves every time. And um, these ones are like these kind of odd shaped that were kind of diamond shaped. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, kind of an art project, but but uh, uh, just kind of a cool thing, you know. And then, um, well, the first thing that we did was this like uh, 12-sided 10-inch, I guess, where... Um, there's different spindle holes. So it's mm. like, like I think there's like three or four different spindle holes and wherever you put the, the record on the spindle on that hole, there'd be a song that went with it. Right. And it was clear. It's a different set of it, grooves for each spindle hole. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And they look like they overlap and they did look like they wouldn't play, but they, they play. Um, that was the first thing we did, which is also 127 pressed, which is a, a magic number for us. For who who's who's magic number? Who who picked that? I guess it's mine. Okay. 127. So you you said okay, how many? 127. Mine in the labels, yeah. Is that a number that you I, had for other parts of your life? I think that they just got to 127 and said we don't want to make any more of these damn things <laughs> because they had to do each one by hand, you know. It's not they're they're not, you know, they're all each one lathe cut, you know, one at a time. So uh uh very time consuming. And you know, they're not cheap because of that. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a lot, a lot of labor that goes into it. Um, so we did that. And then the next one we did was, uh, um, was a lathe cut that was, that was pressed on an actual piece of metal that looked like a symbol. So, and there was even a little video I made where it's like, you could, it doubles as a record. It's a, it's a record. No, it's a symbol. It's a record. Yeah. So, um, the um, thunder pinky. Exactly. That's the one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There, there seemed to be a handful of these the one of them is a looks almost like a christmas ornament i mean oh yeah they did right there's that one too i forgot there's there's also uh, um the joyful noise would have like a christmas party every year and they've always invited me and i've never been able to go but um uh, (laughs) one year they did the lathe cut thing and on records that looked like little snowflakes and and they had me do a christmas song and so i picked uh one of the charlie brown christmas songs by vince girl so, which I thought would be a good one. And one one of the reasons why I'm I'm fascinated with Melvin's is, is there's always uh, in, in your work is there's always a, a different angle on a lot of these, and and a lot of these projects are very ambitious. Uh, you know, endless residency is you know God knows how many albums. Uh, these small little lathe cuts. Is, is there a project uh, that y- you wanted to do that was too ambitious? or couldn't be completed like uh, something you had a vision for, but for some reason it just couldn't come together. Um, nothing really comes to mind. I mean, we have a a lot of goofy ideas all the time and a lot of times we make them work. Mm -hmm. (laughs) 
you know, like um, you mentioned Trevor Dunn. Well, I mean, uh, we uh, we were doing these shows with him while the big business guys were on tour is when they were, we were playing with those guys. We decided to do um, just like kind of an acoustic thing with Trevor, with him playing stand up bass. And while we were, we just like a couple of West Coast shows. And while we were doing that, uh, Buzz had come up with this idea of like, oh, we should do a tour like this and do all 50 states and in 50 days, you know? And we laughed about how stupid of an idea that was and how ridiculous it sounded. And, but usually with something that we think is stupid and ridiculous, we just say, why not? <laughs> and so we did it, you know? Um, there's stuff like that all the time. Um, um, I'm trying to think what else, you know, or like resurrecting the original version of the band, you know, minus, minus Matt Lucan mm-hmm. with the original drummer. So, Stuff like that that I don't know. I guess it keeps things interesting. Yeah, you know. Well, even back if to anything, the, we're not regular. <laughs> no, well, and that's that's what keeps it fresh. Going even going back to the to the Kiss solo LPs. Yeah, on Boner, you know that was ninety two. So Melvin's, right. I guess, were still finding, another goofy idea. That yeah, did, yeah. <laughs> right. but it was uh, now being able to execute that in 1992 was it was there any resistance i mean going up to the boner record company and just saying like look we we don't want to just do one album we want to do three albums that's three times the manufacturing three times kind of everything the posters um, yeah no he was into our ideas you know he's a weirdo too so right tom flynn uh-huh. and tom actually played in the band for a little while he was a fill-in bass player but yeah he played for a while. Mm. sorry about the dog that's all right sounds like he's hungry hey Quiet, quiet, you. Come here. Oh, we got a lap dog. He thinks. Oh, okay. he tries. Um, now, what was the conversation like when it came time for for Stephen to get his own solo album? Some twenty five years later. Yeah, we we always joke that there needed to be one more since we uh, uh you know since we were always only a three piece so. We just thought it was fitting to have Steve McDonald do it since he's also a big Kiss fan like we are and mm-hmm. just seemed like the right thing to do. <laughs> that's quite an honor. That's, you've, you've gone through many different bass players, but to have him kind of join that Mount Rushmore of uh, solo albums. Yeah, right, right. A bit of a message. So, I guess so. I mean, you know, well, we love Steven. So, um, you know, again, he was also into like, our, our, our goofy ideas. Mm-hmm. He welcomed it with the open arms. Of course, of course. When, when you were making those solo, because I, I believe you didn't start with drums. You started with guitar, yeah? Um, as, a, as a musician? As a musician, yeah, yeah. I did, yeah, um, I did. Were you always writing songs? Did you did you keep up with, uh, you know, playing guitar throughout all the years, or did you focus mainly on drums and guitar was just this thing in the corner getting dust? Yeah, kind of. Well, I mean, you know, I started when I was eight, and I remember writing songs when I was eight. But, um, yeah, I just, um, I took, I always liked drums just as much. And, um, you know, a friend of mine, neighbor kid who played guitar just kind of convinced me like, oh, you should play drums. And so, you know, I kind of agreed. And, uh, I mean, it worked out, you know, mm-hmm. worked out just fine. Um, well, you know, I, I mean, I never forgot about guitar, but I just, I don't know. I love the drums and I, feel like I excelled pretty quickly and you know I was playing in bands by the time I was 14 Mm -hmm. so and then joined the Melvins when I was 16. So when it came time for like that solo LP those songs are written by you? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yep. I don't remember if I had any of them written before I might have because I mean by that time I think I bought my first four track Mm -hmm. and um, and started writing stuff that way. I remember when I first started doing that kind of stuff I would I would uh, record drums first you know, and like to have, to have to memorize the song, which sometimes I wouldn't memorize it or I'd add an extra part that wasn't there and I'd have to write around that because I didn't yeah. want to record it again. Um, you know, but but then I figured out like, oh, it's a lot easier if you have guitar first and then you play to it, you know, much easier. So that's how I do things now. I'll lay down guitar first. Like I have a, um, I have a, a Tascam digital eight track now that I got a couple years ago. Um, and has a built-in metronome and I can just come up with guitar stuff and play that first and then go mm-hmm. and add the drums after that. 
so and build on it from there. I, I, I'm curious because I, in uh, I've been having some conversations with a, with a few folks about the future of music and recording and what it means, like with technology playing a role in it. You know, studio yeah. trickery. We've had auto tune, pitch correction for years. We've now entered the age of AI. Um, in, in your mind, where do you draw the line between what's creative, what's a skill motion, and what what isn't? We'll be back after these messages. Well, hey there, record collectors. There's a new service available that specializes in record cleaning, restoring, sticker removal, and professional grading. VMGVinyl.com VMG Vinyl can help you make the most of your collectible records. From professional cleaning of records and sleeves, removing old price tags and store stickers, dry cleaning and rejuvenation of old shrink wrap to make it look like new, even providing you a professional play-tested third-party grade with either removal grading or encasing in plastic you have a wide range of choices at vmgvinyl.com buying a highly collectible record and you want it checked out by an expert vmg vinyl can do that too head over there now and see what vmgvinyl.com can do for you and your collection that's vmgvinyl.com the one-stop shop for professional third-party grading cleaning and record restoration that's vmgvinyl.com Oh, and hey, record nerds, don't forget to clean your records with the very best and safest record cleaner, the Groove Washer. Make your records look and sound their very best and store them with confidence using the new Groove Washer Groove Guard record sleeves. You gotta try this out. It makes a huge difference to the quality of your vinyl experience. Ask for the Groove Washer by name at your local record store and accept no substitutes. Or head over to GrooveWasher.com and use discount code VINYLGUIDE. All hail the Groove Washer. That's GrooveWasher.com, discount code VINYLGUIDE10. Now we return to the program, already in progress. No limits. No limits. I, I'm curious because I, in, uh, I've been having some conversations with a, f- with a few folks about the future of music and recording and what it means like with technology playing a role in it. You know, studio yeah. trickery. We've had auto-tune, pitch correction for years. We've now entered the age of... AI. Um, in, in your mind, where do you draw the line between what's creative, what's a skill motion, and what, what isn't? Like, what's something that's off what's, limits to you and your music? And what's cheating? Yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean, I don't really, I don't really see anything as, as cheating. I mean, people, people will say that kind of stuff. Like, um, I, I mean, digital has just made things easier, but the stuff that we're doing in that realm isn't any different than what bands were doing before you know like for instance like i mean just punching in or whatever or or even like oh i really like half of this song but i screwed it up at the end so i, I did another take where i'm going to use that take you know mm-hmm. do that kind of stuff all the time but i mean we uh, uh have this uh, mastering guy that we use named john golden and he used to be a recording engineer with some kind of big name producers back in, in the sixties. And he, he, he told me how, um, I can't remember the guy's name. It's the guy that, that recorded, um, um, and one of the, I know one of the ones that he worked on was, uh, um, I think maybe he did some mamas and papas stuff and like okay. up, up and away my beautiful balloon, that song, by, I think it's a fifth dimension maybe, but he was saying how he would know like, Oh, I really like the front half of this take that we did. But then, you know, like the, this bridge I like better or this ending part I like better or whatever. And he would cut the whole thing together, you know, just like you would with, with editing in and, mm-hmm. and, uh, uh, Pro Tools or whatever, um, though they were cutting tape, which is much, much more dangerous. But I was like, well, how did, how was it all consistent? Like they didn't have click tracks back then. And like, how did they, how, how did he get around that? And he's like, well, he was working with Hal Blaine, who was really good time-wise as a drummer and they, he would have a metronome in his ear or sometimes he just didn't and had a really good feel and you know and a lot of times it doesn't have to be perfect either but i mean there's stuff that we do now like we never would have been able to make tarantula heart if we were still working with tape you know first off i mean tape's super expensive you know even before even before it didn't exist anymore it was super expensive and mm-hmm. recording time is too things have only gotten easier for us there's no way we would have been we would have been able to make a lot of the records that we've done 
You know, when we first started, we only had enough money to go in the studio for four days. Our first record was done in four days, top to bottom, 18 songs tracked and mixed. Mm -hmm. So I sometimes think like you know, those would have sounded a lot different if we would have had, you know, Beatles time to make a record or whatever. Mm -hmm. But they are what they are, and I'm happy with those records. But, you know, this just made things much easier and smoother. And, you know, I, I, I like that the that, that possibilities are endless. That being said, we still don't mess around. I mean, we work really quickly. Because that's the background that we came from is making records really quickly. Um, we spend a lot more time than we used to, but I like it. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, even me making solo records the way I do, you know, I just I wouldn't have been able to afford it. <laughs> yeah, no way. It would I would have would have been a lot harder. Would have been a lot more time consuming. You know, and it is time consuming. But you know, luckily working with somebody like Toshi, he's really quick. You know, he's quick with everything. You know, get stuff done really fast. Mm -hmm. uh, me just doing this this new solo record. Um, the first time I've worked with him since I kind of moved out of town, you know, before when I was doing stuff, I could, you know, I lived really close. And so I could just go over to his the studio, work on a song or two a day and then go home and, you know, even wait to write lyrics and things like that. But this time I went in there with everything pretty much finished and recorded everything myself. And it took a lot longer than I thought just because I was doing everything, you know, right. I did, I did. I did scratch guitar and then I went and did the drums and I came back and re-recorded the guitar. I did bass. I played almost everything on the on the thing I'm coming up with except for a few guest stars. But we'll talk about that next time. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but for for example, in the um, you, you're planning the, the the next Melvin's tour, and on Tarantula Heart, you've got Roy who's doubling up on drums. He's got some synthesizer. You've got a second guitarist. Gary uh, Chester, is it? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, he plays in a band. He used to be in this band called Ed Hall that were on Boner Records with us a long time ago. And we've uh, we've been friends with him for a long time. And we had just toured with um, his band, We Are the Asteroids. And um, we thought he'd be really good to come in and, and do some, some guitar playing. Mm -hmm. so really liked his guitar playing a lot. So, Are you thinking about touring as a trio or bringing someone else i'm this? not exactly sure you know uh, right now i mean nothing's nothing's set in stone exactly but we'll see okay. we'll see well there's a couple of other uh releases that have been fairly recent that uh i'm, I'm not sure will be played live anytime soon uh the throbbing gristle funk hits with void mains oh right yeah yeah <laughs> how, how did that project come together I think that's something that's been in the works for a long time. I think it started a long time ago. Just something that, that we work on every once in a while. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm not really sure, but I know that we started that like easily like 10 years ago. 10 years ago. Yeah. Okay. All right. Probably. Yeah. Some wow. of it for sure. Okay. So he I don't know. Did the tapes over to void mains and he just kind of ran with it? Had, had the... Probably. Probably. <laughs> he's, he's been a, a friend of ours for a long time too. Yeah. Okay. That we've, we've, that, that we've worked with on and off. And it, it sounds like there's a, a precedent set for recordings being made and then they kind of enter someone's creative process and then they, they output something that you listen to and, and, and it's something that you didn't imagine. It's something that is new to your ears. Well, least. Definitely, definitely this one for sure. You know, I mean, this, I don't know that we've ever quite made a record this way. So, mm -hmm. um, but I mean, we're always working on something, you know, there's always, there's always some kind of plan and we've never stopped. We, you know, we've always just kept moving forward and not, not like sitting back, you know, resting. Right. Because, we, you know, I mean, this is what we do. It's like, you know, I mean, we don't, we can't afford the luxury of like, you know, we don't make enough money to like take a bunch of time off. Mm -hmm. That's why we keep working and working hard. Well, constraints tend to aid the creative process. You have to yeah. kind of work toward that and be resourceful. Sure. Sure. But I mean, you know, it doesn't seem like we ever like, there's no lack of ideas. That's for sure. I mean, we can get in the studio and write songs all day long, you know, mm -hmm. and we do sometimes. How about like the, the, the project you did with uh, Helms Ali controlling data. Oh, yeah. Yeah. What are your memories of recording that EP? I think we were doing, I can't remember if it was like, it might've been during the pandemic. And I know that um, we had toured, no, it was after, it was, no, it was during the pandemic because we toured with them after that. 
and it might have been right at the, the beginning. We knew we wanted to do something with them, and and they were happened to be coming down to LA. I think around Christmas time a few years ago, mm-hmm. and um, yeah, we had tried doing that that um, Who's Could Do song. I think we tried doing it on our own a couple times, and just like for whatever reason, it just didn't seem didn't come out the way we wanted it to. And so we tried it with them and uh, and thought that that came out really good. And then, um, you know, we, w- we knew we wanted to do a thing. We had seen them one time when we played with them. They covered uh, our song At the Stake. They didn't tell us that they were going to do it. And then they started playing it. And I'm listening to it. I'm like, well, what the, you know, like that, that's some balls playing one of our songs before us. But at the same time, I'm like that's like the coolest cover I've heard anybody do of our, of our stuff. Like they, that seemed like, seemed like they got it, you know, and I really liked it a lot. And so, like let's record that and then we'll record one of your guys' songs and then i think we came up with a couple of like a new song too mm-hmm. uh, and then did a scorpions cover <laughs> <laughs> did, did you talk because. did you talk to him afterward about the about how they went about your cover because that, that is ballsy that is risky and th- they must have known and there was probably some nervousness i would imagine in that uh, they didn't seem very nervous and they did a really <laughs> good job of it so you know i mean it inspired me to go on stage and and try to play harder so you know, mm-hmm. it was great. Yeah. And we ended up doing a tour with them after that. And, um, we really liked them. They are great. They're phenomenal. Yeah. I hope, uh, I, I hope someone approves their Australian visas soon. Um, that would be great. They ever <laughs> been there before? Uh, I don't, I've, I don't think I've, I've seen them here. I don't think right. I've seen them here. Um, I'm hoping that at some point we'll also see Mr. Flies down here, but, uh, right. Yeah. There's only two of them, but you know, we'll, we'll see what, uh, easier. Right. Yeah. What they'll be able to, yeah, they could tour in a Prius if they wanted to. Cabbage and Mash, Bakers oh, yeah. and Donkeys. How did that project come together? That you, Glenn well, Burke, Glenn Matlock, Glenn Matlock from Sex Pistols, and uh, our friend Bob Hannum. Okay. So, Bob and myself are big Small Faces song- fans and often talk about them. And um, um, he was friends with uh, Mac, the, the uh, uh, keyboardist. Mm-hmm. organist for for um for the band before he passed away and i don't know just always been fans and we talked about doing some kind of tribute and you know he's like we could get we could get clem to play drums i'm like well that's cool what am i gonna do <laughs> <laughs> so like you could play guitar i'm like okay and so he and i figured out what songs we wanted to do and asked Clem if he would do it. And then we knew that Clem was good friends with Glenn Matlock and mm-hmm. and um, wanted to see if he would be interested as well. And so we did, uh, it was cool, it was great. It was, it was I'm, I'm, I'm happy that we got to do that. So a project like that, you could record again at Toshi's, I would imagine. We did, uh, yeah. Um, is that like a one day, two day sort of thing? Yeah, it didn't take us very long, you know. A um, couple days and then, Glenn, we we had to send the tracks to Glenn for him to do since he's um, uh, UK. Um, so we didn't actually play with him in the studio, but it didn't really matter, you know. Um, mm-hmm. I would love to do more of that with those guys. I've even kind of thought about maybe writing some songs for that project and seeing if they would be interested in, in doing something that was original, mm-hmm. you know. But in that kind of, um, like, uh, uh, that style sort of, you know, yeah. mod. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so there's, it's, it's out there in the universe. Maybe we'll see more of cabbage and mash. Maybe. I don't know if the others know about it, but <laughs> they're I'm, finding I'm out now. Some, yeah. I, I'd like to try some songs. I'll see if they're interested. You know, I had a song that I was going to share with them, but then I liked it enough that I want to put it on my solo record. Yeah. <laughs> so, but I mean, I'll just write more songs. Yeah. You know, if you want to do any small faces stuff, Kenny Jones is still available. He's still out there. That's true. But then what would Clem do? Well, same thing as you. He'd have to find a new job. Have two drummers. That would He'd be perfect. Tambourine. We can get him, and and we, we might as well just get Ron Wood too. Why maybe not? we could get maybe we could get Kenny Jones, Ron Wood, and Rod Stewart to to join uh, Cabbage and Mash. <laughs> and then what perfect. would you we guys do? do? <laughs> well, it would be a big free for all on stage. But I mean, you know, we could do faces and small faces songs. Mm-hmm. And Jeff Beck songs too, and and then we could, then then um, then uh, Ron Wood could play bass. <laughs> what would Glenn do? 
<laughs> Toshi seems to me almost like a like a Willy Wonka factory. Um, yeah. It and and I imagine there's a lot of projects in there that have been started, and there's some intention for them at some future date, but not quite sure what's going to happen with them. I mean, is that a, a fair assumption? Is there kind of a maybe backlog? Mostly, of- maybe a little bit, mostly of our stuff, I suppose. But um, I mean, it's a regular studio that he has bands come in and record all the time. Um, you know, and we're there. We're, we're not there all that much other than when we've got something to do, you know, which is, I mean, it's also where we rehearse. So there's, there's that, but it is a functioning studio for bands that want to come and record there. Mm -hmm. And if they want me to produce, then I'm also available for that. I'm also available to play drums for that kind of stuff too. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Because Toshi's place, I I would imagine. Drummer slept for hire. (laughs) Well, do it while you can, of course. Um, Right. You've got a recording too. Is it like, I mean, you guys must be like 25, 30% of Toshi's, like of, of the working days. It must be related Maybe. to the Melvin's universe. There's a lot. Yeah. And there's, there's other stuff that we're working on too, that hasn't really been revealed yet either. So mm-hmm. um, there's definitely more, you know, we're always working on something, like I said, you know? Okay. So if we get another pandemic, you got, you still got plenty of releases to take us perhaps through those years. Oh well, yeah, I think so. Yeah, we did a lot during the pandemic. I mean, you mm-hmm. know, as much as we could recording wise, uh, but then also with like re-releases and things like that, you know, we didn't we didn't want to uh, we didn't want to do nothing. Right. And we had to keep it. The Matt Cameron EP, Gory Scorch Yeah. Right. Tell me tell me about your view. How did how how that came together and and uh, your memories of that? Well, we. um I had just done the Chris Cornell tribute uh, show in Los Angeles um, at the forum. And I know that we were like, I know that we were one of the first bands kind of talked about doing that because Matt had said that um, Chris's favorite bands were uh, the Beatles and the Melvins, which, you know, anytime both those bands get mentioned in the, in the, in the same sentence is, is okay by me <laughs> so um you know i think that maybe he did want to try to get paul mccartney to play that show but i don't you know i don't know that well obviously it didn't happen but uh, um but we played and um we had done a, a version of Spooman that was a little different from theirs and um they liked it and then at the same time matt was working on some solo stuff and he was also working with taylor hawkins mm-hmm. with taylor singing and so, um, you know, like, yeah, it was not long after that, that uh, tribute show that Matt wanted to come to our studio and work with us. And, you know, he had all these songs and, um, you know, he's also a guitar player, mm-hmm. but he, he just, he really wanted, uh, you know, Buzz to play guitar and Steven to play bass. And I know I even played some guitar in it someplace. And then there's a couple of things where there's, you know, I played some drums too. Yeah, I'm, you know, we've known Matt for a long time, and and um, it was really great. We would love to do more with him. And and when he shared the concept of it going to like a, a full blown Melvin's parody, an homage. Yeah, I didn't know that. I didn't know that until it came out. So until it came you know, out, okay. Well, until it was announced, yeah, and I was like, oh wow, <laughs> that's great. You know, I I I, I totally approve. Mm. It was very nice. That you've, uh, you know, you've done double drumming with a lot of different drummers. Do, do you have sessions? Do, have you done double drumming with uh, with Taylor? No, I never did. You know, and and you know, honestly, I I didn't really get to meet him until that Chris Cornell tribute. Mm. You know, but um, I really liked him a lot, and he was um, he was the type of person that when I met him, I felt like it was somebody that I'd known for a long time. Mm-hmm. You know, he felt like an old friend. So I was really sad that that um, that he that he passed away. You know, mm. he was such a great drummer too. And I, you know, I feel real bad for for his band and and his his family. You know, mm-hmm. bummer. You know? Yeah. Do you know of any Melvin's recordings that the band is unable to re-release uh, for any reason, or rights, or missing tapes, or anything like that? No, not. Not really. I mean, there's, um, 
I mean, there might be a little bit of unreleased stuff, but I mean, it'll, it'll be released eventually. You yeah. know? But I mean, pretty much everything that we record, we use. You know, we hardly we hardly waste anything. Right. Right. <laughs> so, but yeah, there's nothing nothing that's been recorded where it's like we can't put it out. You know, not that I know of anyway. Mm-hmm. All right. I know the Atlantic stuff is being handled mainly by I think Third Man is. Yeah, uh, you know, I know that there's. I don't know if it ever got released, but there's there's at least a song someplace there that we had forgotten about. And then when, when those guys got the tapes back, we or the, when they got the tapes from Atlantic to uh, press it, uh, I know Ben Blackwell was like, hey, what's this? I'm like, oh, yeah, I remember that, sort of. And I got a copy of it. I'm like, oh, yeah. So um, I can't remember if we released it or not, but there is there's there is something unreleased. Do you, do you remember which album it was? For? Was it attached to Stag or something? I think it was, I think it was, um, God, I, I want to say that it was, um, fuck, what was it? It might've been Houdini. Mm-hmm. You know? I, think, I think it might've been Houdini, but now I can't remember. So if a song, and it, you know, I, I'm not sure if it, maybe you'd know this, but if a song is, was recorded around the same time as Houdini, but not used for Houdini, does that, st- is that song still controlled by the powers that be at Atlantic or is that, they probably have rights to the recording of it, but I mean, we could certainly re-record the song and use it. I think no problem. Right. Okay. I mean, we were we were able to record that live, the live record, the live Houdini record. Mm-hmm. You know, no problem without having to pay them anything to do that. But they would own the record. Any any of the stuff that we had recorded then, you know, like that this song in particular, um, I think that they would have the rights to. So right. at least at least own it. They would own it, but I'm sure that you know. I don't see why it couldn't be released somehow. Do you remember the name of the song? Gibby. Gibby, as in like, yeah. Gibby Haynes. Gibby. Well, the, the, I don't know if it was necessarily about him. I think okay. it was spelled with three Gs. I can't remember why. <laughs> okay. So right. it's actually g- 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 Gibby. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, I'm sure we'll. Uh, some listener will quickly correct me about where that's available if it is. So, yeah, it might be, and I just don't realize it. Okay, <laughs> fair enough. Um, uh, one one last thing before we 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 wrap up again on uh, Tarantula Heart, but I understand you were in a band called the Meltors, a Mentors cover band. Yeah, sort of. Actually, I think we were called Simplex One. <laughs> okay, Simplex One, okay. something like that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we would occasionally do mentors covers if even if it was like us at a gig and just like playing a couple extra songs at the end of our set um, but I know there was a show that we played it was a long time ago it was back in Olympia at this place called Tropicana and it must have been about 84 or 85 mm-hmm. and um, there was a band called March of Crimes uh, that the band was friends with um, actually uh, uh, Ben Shepard from Soundgarden was the guitar player of that band Okay. And they, I can't remember what happened. They either, they broke up and didn't make the gig or somehow couldn't make the gig. So we were down one band. And so we, uh, um, we opened playing mentor songs, probably mentors and Judas Priest songs or something like that. You know, <laughs> we also had an alter ego called society skate youth patrol mm-hmm. where we used to play, uh, 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 black Sabbath and Judas Priest songs. <laughs> I know we opened for ourselves someplace when we did our very first tour and people liked that a lot more than they liked the dolphins. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cause it was kind of a joke. Yeah. Society they, skate youth patrol. Are there any of those projects you still kind of think about and like kind of wonder what if? Not really. <laughs> well, there was another one called the stiff woodies too. Mm. That was a, a rotating cast of, of, uh, of uh, members. I think I played guitar um, I might have played drums a little bit, and some of the songs actually ended up being Melvin songs eventually. Um, but at one time, I know Kurt Cobain was playing drums, and Chris Novoselic was playing guitar, and this was all like pre-Nirvana. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I think we played, we didn't play that many times. We played a couple parties here and there. The stiff <laughs> woody. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, because there was a band in Seattle called the Limp Richards, and so oh, we'll be the opposite of them. <laughs> Or the stiff woodies. <laughs> Do you remember any of the songs that you played? Is it all covers? And 
Yeah, there was there was um no it wasn't it wasn't covers. There was the original songs. Um I know one of them became one of them's on Houdini. And what's it called? Um it's one that actually Cobain plays guitar on. I can't think of the title right now, but whatever one that is. <laughs> Shows you how much I know about the, the songs on Houdini. <laughs> Uh, our most popular record or actually Cobain I think he does he play guitar or does he sing maybe he does both um, can't remember hang on a second Cobain Sky Pop that's it that's yep. it that was, that was a Stiff Woody song um, there's a song called I Like Porn that was one of those songs and uh, it seems like though there was there was one called Breakdance Boogie I remember that Nova Selich sang it and it was about it was about getting drunk and puking on your shoes yeah. <laughs> while you're dancing while you're break dancing are there any tapes of the stiff woodies at all <laughs> there might be i don't know seems like seems like we might have done some of those songs like on a radio show or something like that but i, I can't remember do you like have a box of tapes or things like that that you still need to go through and digitize and figure out what's on them yeah i've got way too many i've got more than anybody else does probably <sighs> Can you please do that soon? <laughs> we want to hear some of those things. Maybe. Before they disintegrate. I, yeah, I know. It'll just take forever. You know, but I probably should. You know, they're not they're stored well. <laughs> yeah. They're you know they're in nice tape cassette boxes that that um, you know, in a in a cool, dry place. Yeah. So you know, I mean I know that there's a place in um in LA that that does tape transfer stuff and they do everything. Mm-hmm. You know, they do, they do, um, um, whatever format you could think of, including cassette four track yeah. so, and that kind of stuff, including cassettes. So, um, I, if I had to, if something was really bad, they could probably transfer it. Yeah. I know there's some, places, probably do that. I know there's some places that'll do kind of in bulk, but you, you kind of never know about those places. It could just be someone with a whole bunch of tape decks that may not be looking after the ideal sound quality. Yeah. And the trans- no, these guys are legit. I've, I've taken some stuff to them. Oh, okay. So yeah, they're totally legit. Yeah. You know, and good people too. Excellent. Well, yeah, let's, uh, round and one. Okay. Well, hopefully, hopefully when we talk about your, uh, your, your solo stuff in a couple of months, that'll, uh, I'll tell you what my progress is. I'm going yes. through my old cassette. <laughs> all right. <laughs> well, I look forward to that update. Dale Covert, ladies and gentlemen, Tarantula Heart by Melvins or The Melvins. Pre-orders are out now. Go to ipecac.com. There are some special vinyl variants. I think there's a puke green for the 25th anniversary of Ipecac. There's uh, an indie exclusive Silver Streak version. And each of them come with a 12-page booklet, as some of the Melvin's reissues of late have been coming with. They're really just nice printed, beautiful artwork inside there. Uh, There's, of course, CDs. There's going to be digital and everything. I think the release date is in April, April 19th. But you want to get your pre-orders in now. Ipecac.com. Dale, thank you so much, mate. And we'll miss you in Australia, you but hopefully we'll, uh, yeah. we'll, catch, we'll catch you on the other uh, hemisphere soon. I'll be back. Rebuilt. <laughs> Better than ever. <laughs> ah, there he is. Dale Crover from one of the greatest bands in the history of humankind, Melvins, announcing their new album, Tarantula Heart, available for pre-order. There's vinyl variants. Get up there and grab them while you can. Ipecac.com. Uh, secure your copy, and then wait patiently by your mailbox for the next few months for it to arrive. And that's it for this episode of The Vinyl Guide. Thank you so much for tuning in. Hey, do me a favor. Please leave us a positive review on Apple Podcasts and or Spotify. Hop in there, say something nice, give us five out of five stars. That's always appreciated. And of course, when you tell your friends and share these episodes on social media, that's a huge help as well. And we'll be back shortly with a brand new episode. So until we talk next time, get out there and buy some records, people. Cheers. That's it for this episode of The Vinyl Guide. Follow The Vinyl Guide in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or whatever podcast app you use and enjoy the full back catalog of episodes of The Vinyl Guide podcast. Thanks again for listening.